So, Bruchim Abayim, welcome everybody. It's Tanit Esther today, the fast of Esther. We're not going to talk so much about the fast, except perhaps in the context of Megillat Esther. I wanted to focus on that today rather than Parshat Tetzaveh. Although, surprisingly, you, you may see some interesting connections between Tetzaveh and Megillat Esther, but we're not going to go there this morning. So actually, I, I want to ask you a, a couple of questions before we start. First thing I'll mention is that you don't need to have Megillat Esther with you as we look into some of the text. I'll, I'll be mentioning certain words and passages, but nothing that you really need to have in front of you. If you would like to and you have something at home, fantastic. If not, I've put in the chat box the link to safaria.org with the specific connection to uh, Megillat Esther. So if you'd look, like to look at that while we're going, you can just access that link. That, that might be helpful. So I'm, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and if you could perhaps share in the chat box. It's, it's nothing that you need to consider any dissertation. It's simply very, very simple, short answer questions, the kind that you love to see on, on final exams. So the first question is, and, and don't think because I'm asking it today that I would expect you to answer something that's relevant to today or this evening. But if I were to ask you, what is the favorite, not so much passage, but favorite story or narrative or section of the Tanakh, not the, just the Torah, but the entire Jewish Bible, what is your favorite story in the Jewish Bible? Just kind of throw in something. You know, when I say that your favorite, it doesn't have to be your favorite. One of your most favorite. It doesn't have to be the favorite. Forget about the uh, superlative. Just anything that comes to mind in terms of uh, a story that engages you in the Tanakh, throw it into the chat box. I'm just kind of curious. Story of Ruth. So those who just joined us, my question was, what story, what is the, one of the most, your, one of your favorite stories in the Tanakh? Not just the Torah, but the entire Jewish Bible. Something that really engages you, that uh, gets you excited or annoyed. So we got the story of Ruth. We've got Joseph seeing his brothers again. Uh -huh. Tamar tricking Jacob. Shirat Hayam, Song of the Sea. Anyone else? Take a stab at it. Just to throw something out there that you think of when you when you think of uh, something interesting or fascinating from the from the Jewish Bible. Book of Ruth. Good. Yeah, you can say the same thing that somebody That's else. Somebody else. Uh, Passover. Okay, the Passover story. Good. Story of Joseph. Jonah. Okay. All right. That's enough for starters. Uh, interesting that if you look at those stories, and I guess you can say this pretty much about any narrative, uh, most of those stories, if not all of them, I won't say all of them because there's one that doesn't have, but most of those stories have the element of involvement or participation of women to some extent in one element of the story. It may not be the focus and may not be what you were thinking of, but certainly there is a, there is a female uh, element in most of those stories. Now, my second question to you is this. We often look at the role of women in the Bible in the Tanakh in not the most favorable terms. We certainly think of those who take on roles that we might like to emulate, roles that we think are significant and empowered. So my question to you is this, and again, just because we're on Purim, that needn't determine your choice, but if you were to think of a woman in the Tanakh, Again, the entire Bible, not, not just the Torah, but in the entire Tanakh, a woman that you admire. Again, it doesn't have to be your favorite or the strongest, just a woman that you admire in the Tanakh. 
who would that be? And if you can just in one word, when you put the name in there, just say what it is about that woman that uh, causes you uh, to feel admiration for her. Maybe, maybe just a word or two. Yeah, don't, as I said, don't, don't write a long paragraph. Just a word or two, which is, would be the source of your admiration for that individual. So Ruth, loyalty, okay? Hana, resolve. The five daughters, justice, great. Miriam, she led the uh, the women. Okay, so Miriam leading the women, great. Rivka getting what she wanted, all right. <laughs> okay again that's that's uh, just just to get kind of get an idea so whether it's because you chose to avoid or whether because genuinely you don't necessarily identify or admire the women in the story of Megillat Esther, that's all good. What I wanted to do today is take a little bit of a look at perhaps Esther, but also Vashti, and try to get a little bit of a sense of who, who these women are and what it is about them, if anything, that we find engaging, admirable, meritorious of such renown with regards to this story. So I've taken a look at a number of different uh, commentaries from different sides of the religious spectrum to try to get a sense of how we can see something that's relevant today for us in Vashti and Esther, maybe, maybe more on Esther, but certainly not to the neglect of Vashti. So I'm going to ask you this question before we start to take a look at that. Uh, we don't read of any opportunity where Esther and Vashti met. We just read about the fact that Vashti does what she does and doesn't do what she's supposed to do. She's taken away. Interestingly, doesn't say she's executed. She loses her crown and she disappears, fades from the story at the end of chapter one. And that's the end. That's the last we hear of her. We haven't got a clue what really happened to her in the end. If, and we don't really know exactly what her reasons were for not. And we'll come back to that in a moment. And then Esther appears, and then we have the story of Esther. But let me ask you this. If in their entrance and exit, respectively, they were happy, they just happened to cross paths at the doorway. Vashti's on her way out. Esther's on her way in. What do you think they might have said to one another? So this I'm not going to ask you to write. This I'm going to ask you to think about it for a minute and then perhaps share it uh, vocally. It's, it's a little too much to write. So again, what might uh, Esther and Vashti have said to one another as one was leaving the palace and one was entering? Be careful what you choose. <laughs> Good luck with uh, the king. <laughs> what was that? The... Good luck with the king. <laughs> the king, okay. I was gonna say, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Okay, so so far everybody said, I, I assume, and you can correct me if, if that's not the case, what Vashti is saying to Esther. What might Esther have said to Vashti? I didn't want this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I need to do it. I have a higher calling or something to that effect. Uh, I need to do this, yes. She would say to her, he's not, just be careful what you do. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Okay. So it, it would be interesting to, to have heard a conversation as brief as it might have been, had their paths crossed uh, as each of them fades away or enters into prominence in the story. So 
Let's let's take a look a little bit first at Vashti. So there are different interpretations as to exactly what it was uh, that happened, why it was that she refused to appear before the king. So there is a Midrash in, in Esther Rabbah, one of the medieval commentaries, that say it was out of modesty. And when we think of, it's, it's interesting, because when we think of Vashti, what do we think of? What, what kind of individual do we think of? I'm going to bring up a, a, a painting. Let me know. Just give me a thumbs up when it comes on the screen. Sometimes it takes a moment. So I, I, I could have asked you, but I, I don't want to tire you out by asking you question after question. So when we, when we think of Vashti, we often thought about this beautiful woman not quite in the in the sense of, of Delilah, a seductress, but we think of a beautiful woman who perhaps feels a little too empowered, uh, perhaps somewhat arrogant, uh, someone who doesn't really, really quite fit the mold of what Ahasuerus was looking for. It's interesting because it doesn't say how long Vashti was the queen for. Is this all of a sudden this one incident of refusing to show up for a, a, a party? or some kind of feast that the king all of a sudden decided to do away with her? Is it a pattern that she'd been exhibiting earlier on? We don't know. But we do know from what the response of the servants and advisors of the king is, that this is something that causes great concern and great anxiety. Uh, the fact that what is it? what is going to be said in households if the queen refuses to... Uh, accede to the king's demands and wishes. How is that going to reflect on the relationships between men and women? God forbid women should feel empowered to say no and refuse their husbands. And that, that is one of the more powerful and in the most uh, understated of terms, annoying of elements in the first chapter. And of course, it goes far beyond annoying. Uh, if we look at the fact that everything is supposed to be done according to the king's wishes for the sanctity of male dominance in a relationship, it's not really something we can identify so much with today. And often we've tried to look at Vashti as this uh, element of rebellion, of a woman standing up for her rights, paying the price, as we know many women have who've, who've tried to do that uh, centuries, let alone in modern times. But the fact that she's able to stand up, even if she's will, you know, even at the uh, implication of losing her crown and being abandoned and banished to wherever we don't know, that's something perhaps that we admire in Vashti. We see her, interestingly, often as a favorable character in that sense. And again, that's just one way of looking at it. It's interesting that there's there's another midrash in, in the Babylonian Talmud that says we were on she was unhappy with the way she appeared that day, uh, and it says that all of a sudden she'd been uh, she had leprosy, and of course she didn't want to appear publicly in front of anybody, uh, but often we try to see her as some kind of uh, proto feminist, somebody who is willing at uh, anachronistic time to stand up for women's rights and suffers the consequences. And that's perhaps projecting a little bit too much on her, I might, I might say. When we look at Esther, we find a, a, a kind of a different view. So I'll, I'll, let me just share another photo. And again, there are many different photos of both Vashti and Esther. This is just one. Oops. There we go. So uh, let's just make it a little smaller, sorry. Okay, so here's Esther uh, with the king, not included, but uh, with uh, Haman as part of, in part of the feast. So this Esther looks a lot different than the Vashti lying on the couch. Uh, she's dressed fairly modestly, and often our view of Esther if you think of the way you viewed Esther growing up as a kid, and I might ask you that, uh, what was your understanding of Esther? As a, not, not today, but as a child, hearing the story of the Megillah, what did you think of Esther? What did you admire 
or focus on Esther, whether you maybe perhaps you didn't admire it, but what was your impression of Esther when you first heard the story of the Megillah? It was weak at the beginning. Okay, weak at the beginning, and what, what happens? And then um, she gets strength from the, the banquet that uh, the king does come to her when she asks. Is that what you thought of as a, as, as a child? Yeah, that or is that, is that your understanding of her now? Yes, maybe it's that to now. I don't know. So I, it's a bit of a difficult question to try to think of what you thought of Esther back then. Uh, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll share what I thought of Esther. I remember reading about Esther, uh, and it, I'm sure it was shaped by the school I went to and the way she was presented uh, at school. Uh, and I don't hesitate to say that I went to Associated and chat. Uh, Esther was an admirable character. She took seriously her responsibility to the Jewish people, even at the great sacrifice to herself personally. Uh, she realized what she needed to do. She acceded to the requests, uh, but much power, more powerful language, the command of her uncle, her pseudo father. That's another issue we'll come back to in a moment. Uh, she did what needed to be done because she was part of something greater than herself. It wasn't her interests. And I, I, I use those terms, even though I may not have thought exactly in those terms, but that's the way I thought of Esther. Some, a figure that's admirable because she represented uh, the best of the Jewish people. Now, you may laugh and smile at that. That's what I thought of as a kid. That's the way I looked at Esther. Um, I also went to uh, Associated, by the way, Mm -hmm. And Esther was always uh, thought of by all of us as the most beautiful. She, after all, she won a beauty pageant. Um, but beauty would be in the eye of the beholder. But, you know, dressed up, you'd always think of Esther as the most beautiful woman. That's right. And I remember at school as well. And I'm glad you mentioned that, David, because I remember at school when we when people got dressed up, it was seen as sometimes and in some cases <laughs> somewhat presumptuous to dress up as Esther if you weren't, in fact, that beautiful young girl. And it's, it's a harsh thing to say, but that, I mean, that's the way kids, uh, as cruel as they often are at that age, uh, look at those things. So in order to dress up as Esther, you had to fit the role, not just uh, get find the right dress, but you had, to be, you had to be that beautiful person. And I remember, uh, maybe not hearing it directly, but I remember certain girls in, our, in my classes uh, being somewhat intimidated about getting dressed up as Esther, while others, I imagine, and I don't know this because I, I didn't go through that personally. I, back then, I, I wasn't into wearing dresses on Purim, although I certainly have done that in recent years. But anyway, that's another story. But uh, I imagine there were some who, specifically because they never had a chance to be considered a pretty girl, that this was their opportunity, as, as Purim is. It's, it's a fantasy for many of us to get dressed up as those things, uh, perhaps that we fear, but also perhaps that we long to be and want to identify with. And that's our opportunity to do that. And so I imagine there were girls who got dressed up as Esther because they felt uh, somewhat insecure and didn't uh, feel good about the way they looked and, and did that. Uh, again, that, that's, that's perhaps another uh, sociological, psychological exploration, uh, but it, it's worth mentioning because when we look at Esther and try to understand what we admire, about her, often we talk about her beauty. And it's interesting, in the Talmud, it talks about the four most beautiful women in the Tanakh. Any idea who those are? You know that one is Esther. Who else, um, who else Rachel, do you know? Rachel. Interestingly, no. Really? I, I, I remember when, the, when I first came across this years ago, I said, what do you mean Rachel is described as this beautiful woman at the well? Jacob is completely taken by her. Yet she's is it Rivka also? One of those four. Um, Delilah, but is no, she in the, no, no, she's not in the, no, no. she Actually, knew Delilah, uh, if I, if I may, knew what to use that, what she had, but she's okay. not described as, as one of the most beautiful women. Uh, Laura? So I'll, I'll tell you rather than keep you guessing, Laura. So, Sarah. Sarah. Sarah is described, and you recall, it's interesting that Abraham doesn't notice her beauty until he needs to, until uh, he goes down to Egypt and says, Oi, you're beautiful. What's the, the king's going to want? The pharaoh's going to want to take you as his wife. What do I got to do? All of a sudden, I notice you're beautiful when it's going to be a problem for me. <laughs> but Sarah is one of them. Uh, interestingly, Abigail, 
Fascinatingly, it doesn't include Avishag, who is the concubine searched for throughout the land to keep King David warm in his old age. Not with so much of a sexual connotation, somebody simply to lie by the king's side and keep him warm. And you might ask, what does an old man need the most beautiful woman? Just a, a warm body is a warm body. And yet they go to search for this beautiful woman, Abishag. They find her and she's brought to the king. Uh, but not Abishag, she's not included. Fascinatingly, Rachav. Rachav, the prostitute in Jericho that saves those two spies that Joshua sends. She is considered one of the four most beautiful women. That's a whole other lesson in itself, but Esther is one of those four. So this, the, the fact that we emphasize the beauty of Esther is, is something that I imagine has impacted on children, at least, if not uh, their parents as well, for, for generations and generations and generations. That's something we often think about. Uh, but it's fascinating. If you look at the text, it talks about the fact that she was beautiful, and yet... Why, what, how is the king taken by Esther? So let me read to you the Hebrew. It says, um, at the beginning of chapter two, after they've decided to have this beauty pageant, if we want to re refer to it as such, it says, asher titav timloch tachat vashti. It says, it doesn't say, we shouldn't be calling it a beauty pageant. Here it doesn't say the most beautiful woman, as determined by the king, will be the one who takes over the crown from Vashti. It says the one who finds favor in the king's eyes. That doesn't necessarily mean the most beautiful. It says when Esther is brought and participates, it says... Vatitav uh, hanara ve'inav. She found favor in his eyes, and she was considered uh, uh, something worth beholding. But it doesn't talk about her looks in that context. It says later on that Esther was beautiful, but it doesn't say that that's what attracted the king. It just says that she found favor in his eyes, and he loved her upon seeing her. So this idea of the beauty, sometimes we emphasize, but that's not what it says in the text. It says she found favor. Why did she find favor in his eyes? I imagine the beauty had something to do with it, but there must have been something else about Esther. And commentators say, and perhaps this is what Ruth was hinting at before, Esther had a certain, there's no question, when she goes in there, she had a certain humility about her. And perhaps it's that humility in comparison to what the king perceived as Vashti's arrogance, which is attractive and appealing to the king. He's just had this horrible incident and probably embarrassing because he wanted to bring out this beautiful wife, the queen, and she refused to come. Think of how he must have been shamed. And so this demonstration of arrogance and independence is the last thing that the king wants to see in his future queen. So the moment Esther walks in, she probably, although it doesn't say anything to that extent, she probably had her head bowed down. She probably walked uh, in a very modest way, uh, maybe dressed somewhat like the uh, um, uh, painting that I showed you before, not in any seductive way, not in any uh, expose type of way, but in a way that would have appealed to the king at this time, particularly after what he had just experienced. That's probably part of what attracted him about Esther. And why would she have been like that? And this brings me, why, why would she have been such a, a humble uh, person? Why, why, would she, why would she have that characteristic? And so I, I want to share something very briefly with you. Have you, anybody heard of Rucham Weiss? The what? Rucham Weiss, an Israeli poet, writer, teacher yeah. of Talmud, uh, who mm -hmm. is from an Orthodox background, but uh, at some at very early in her life, already in high school, she decided that, that the Orthodox way of thinking was not for her as, as an independent woman. And she's written some beautiful poetry. She's written fantastic commentaries uh, on the Talmud uh, from a feminine perspective. She has taught in the she conservative has... movement in Israel. 
and is, is a wonderful example uh, of a woman who has found a path uh, that wasn't the one on which she began, another path. And when she writes about Esther, she talks about the story of Esther being somewhat like the story of Cinderella. And she mentions that the story of Cinderella, without going into uh, statistical proof, is probably the most well-known folk story or fairy tale, however we describe it, in uh, human history. And when I talk about Cinderella, it's not specifically Cinderella. It's the, this idea of somebody who grows up in a decent household, but becomes an orphan, is taken in by someone, uh, is perhaps uh, abused, taken advantage of, not treated well, and eventually rescued by a gallant, brave prince. So that's, you don't have to call the person Cinderella to find that story and that motif in many folk tales, not just in Western culture, but throughout uh, human culture. So she says that the story of Esther is similar to the story of Cinderella. Uh, she is orphaned at whatever age, we don't know, her parents, she grew up in a family that was an immigrant family. Her family was one of the, part of the exiles who were taken away after the destruction of the temple and settled in Babylon. So she's already from the beginning, some kind of an outsider. And only later on, does, when uh, she's rescued, <laughs> if you can say she's rescued by a Hashverosh, uh, not exactly Prince Charming as, as you would imagine, but somebody who takes her in and empowers her uh, through the fact that she becomes the queen in of uh, Parasu Madai, Paris and uh, uh, Persia and Medes, however we uh, understand those, those areas. So this idea of a, of a woman who doesn't really have full empowerment is something that's very common and certainly with the story of Esther as well. And Ruth, you mentioned before that she starts off what you may say weak. I use the word humble perhaps, uh, but somebody who doesn't feel empowered. But later on, it seems like she does uh, acquire some kind of power. Uh, before that, of course, in addition uh, to being subjected to the uh, contest of who's going to be the next queen, she does what she's told by the servants of the king, going through the whole process of being prepared to be the queen. She does what she's told as commanded by Mordechai. And the words are incredibly powerful. It says, Kasher tziva aleha Mordechai, as Mordechai commanded her. It doesn't say requested. It doesn't say asked. It doesn't say suggested. It doesn't say advised. It uses the word tziva. Mordechai commanded her not to reveal the nation from which she's come, the fact that she's Jewish, uh, not to say anything about her background, about her humble background, the fact that she was an orphan, the fact that she was brought here uh, to this land as an exile, she's not originally from here. He forbade her from saying anything about that. And she accedes to his demand. Why? Maybe she realized it's in her best interest. Maybe she simply is continuing uh, a policy and an experience of being told what to do, of being commanded what to do, of not having independence. And we know enough about uh, people who are in those situations for whom it's very difficult to change that habit. Uh, you get used to being about doing what you're told to do. And to change that is something very, very, very challenging. But of course, we do see later on in the story, uh, she does realize that she has power. And then she begins to use it. Uh, just before I, I return to that, I'll mention that I, met, I, I said that the term used in Mordechai's discourse with Esther is tziva. He commanded her to do that. It does say a number of times Amar said to her, but the fact that even it's used a couple of times, this word tziva is very, very powerful. And what does it say about Esther all the time? How does she enter the palace? How is she moved from one situation, transition from one to another? What's the term that's used a few times? Vatilakach. She is taken. It doesn't say she goes, she went. It says she is taken. The fact that she is taken is, again, a very, very powerful mnemonic in the Bible, because when we talk about the word taken, we always talk about a man taking a woman for their wife. 
Vayikach otal isha. He took her as her wife. That happens innumerable times in the Tanakh. And so the fact that the writer, the editor of Megillat Esther, uses that same term is saying something about the relationship and the dynamic between men and women, uh, specifically in terms of the marital relationship. And so there's a very powerful use of that term. It's not by coincidence. It's used uh, very purposefully uh, because it'll be reminiscent of this idea that somebody took a wife, took a woman for their wife. It's the initiative, it's the power, it's the authority of the male which determines whether a woman is going to be part of a relationship or not. Now, you might say, well, there are instances that are not quite like that in the, in the Bible. You're right. But the majority are like that. And anybody who studies the Tanakh will find that it's very, you know, this is not news to you, it's very patriarchal. I'll be a bit hesitant about calling it misogynist, but there are plenty of elements of that as well in, in some of these stories. So the fact that Esther comes from that type of dynamic, but moves to a place where eventually she realizes she has a certain power. And what is that power? The power is something that she sees in perhaps what Vashti tried to do, but she does in a different way. As you recall, it was Vashti, Vashti was asked, um, was called to come to join the king for his feast with his guests. Um, and she refuses, of course. Esther is afraid to go to the king without being asked. It's kind of a reverse situation. One is asked and refuses. One isn't asked and is afraid to initiate. But she decides, again, at great risk to herself and because she's been told to do so by Mordechai, she goes to the king and tries to ask to meet with him. We don't know exactly how that worked. We have the text that she says, well, if, if, if uh, it is favorable to the king, then perhaps he'll join me for a feast. She realizes once she's there, she, he's not going to kill her. She realized very quickly, and that probably influences, why didn't she just ask that first time? Why didn't she bring up the subject the first time? Is it because she had this plan in advance about, well, let me do it three times and kind of work it in very slowly? I doubt very much that Mordechai advised her so, and I doubt very much that she had this plan in her head as well. But I would imagine that when she comes to the king and she sees that she's not going to be taken away and beheaded or whatever they did back then to punish uh, or banish perhaps like Vashti, she realizes, you know what? I need to work this a little better. Uh, I can't just take this chance all at once. I'm here. Let me see if I can work things up to the point where I'll be a little bit more effective. So I think she probably realizes that Vashti had the right idea. She just went about it in too drastic, too sudden a manner. There would have been a more effective way of empowering yourself and demonstrating that you have some independence and, and power. And Esther, perhaps you might call her a quick study. She realizes quickly that, you know what? Things aren't going as, as poorly as I thought they might. Let me see how I can work this to the best effect possible. And so she goes through that series of inviting to different feasts and then uh, having her time with the king alone and then inviting Haman to the feast and then inviting them to a third feast. And by that time, the king is probably completely enamored with her to the point that he respects her assertiveness and her independence because it's done in a way that he doesn't feel threatened. She's come to him, she's respected him, she's doing all she needs to do, probably bows down, whatever the curtsy she did back then, who knows, there aren't that many details in the Megillah, but she's doing everything in the most respectful ways with, by now, some plan about taking advantage of the situation at the right moment when she can approach the king with her demand about, I and mean, her fear about what an accusation, about what Haman has in mind for her people, and even admit the fact that she's Jewish. She can't do it initially. She needs to build up that sense that the king feels comfortable with her, not only comfortable because she's beautiful, not only comfortable because she's his queen and he can do with her what he wants, but because she has shown that she's respectful and yet 
there's something appealing about a woman who has that element of independence. Now you might say, all right, you're reading something into uh, King Ahasuerus' ability to appreciate uh, such a woman. Maybe I am, but her tactics are successful. We, we see that the King Ahasuerus was afraid and concerned, especially through the advice of his, uh, of his servants, that people might think otherwise. But here's a woman who's able to approach him in a way that is, you might even say, somewhat more seductive because she is showing a little more independence. Not somebody who accedes to every demand and every wish and every command, but somebody who appears to be more tempting because of that uh, element and demonstration of independence. And so Esther quickly develops a way of dealing with her situation. And yet, what happens as we move through? First of all, why was this whole situation brought about? Because of Mordechai, because of Mordechai's conceit. What's the big deal about bowing down to somebody? Jews haven't bowed down to people in different generations. Jews haven't accepted their situation that they are foreigners, that they are outsiders, and learned the best way to get along with that government. It doesn't mean groveling. It doesn't mean uh, suffering a fate that, that, that's a horrible one, but it means realizing what your situation is read the circumstances, accept them, and get along as best as you can, and work as Esther works with her situation at improving things, gain the trust of the people. And, and you might want to respond, well, they're all, they're all, everyone's anti-Semitic. No matter what you do, they're never going to accept us. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a very constructive attitude to take. But I think Jews have learned to be much more uh, efficient and effective in how they deal with powers uh, where they themselves don't have a great amount of power. Uh, we often talk about the disasters and the traumas in Jewish history. There are plenty of centuries and many more years of success and effective coexistence with non-Jews than there are of, of years where we faced uh, murder and annihilation. And it's just, we simply t tend to emphasize the latter. So why this entire preamble? Because Mordechai is a little bit too concerned, and perhaps you might say, I dare say, a little full of himself. He brings this situation on Esther and on his people because he won't bow down to Haman. Look, you've got lousy people. You've got lousy people in workplaces. You've got lousy people in governments. You've got lousy people all the time. You need to find a way of, of working with them and, and working to the most effective way. You don't need to challenge and antagonize people to bring on potential disaster. You gotta be a little more practical. And I think Jews have been very practical. Sometimes, of course, beyond our control, we, we, we can't. In whatever practical terms we take, it's to no avail. But in many instances, it is. Mordechai is not that person. Uh, unfortunately, he brings on the situation which Esther is the one who has to deal with it. And it's interesting, Ruhama Weiss talks about that. She mentions the fact that, you know, Esther, should not have had to deal with that. The, the Jews in Persia should not have had to face annihilation. It's only because of, the, of this person, Mordechai, we don't know exactly the dynamic between Mordechai and Esther either. Uh, it's saying, near the beginning, it says, Mordechai, once her parents had passed away, I guess, and she was orphaned, Lakachlo Levat, took her as a daughter. He was his uncle, but took her as a daughter, sounded like a father figure to protect her and take her in because her parents were no longer around. There's a commentator that says it should read, Lakachoto Levait. They add a yud in between the bait and the taf. And what does that mean, Levait? Took her as his wife, took Esther as his wife, even though there was perhaps, and most likely, this. Uh, uh, significant difference in age. And some of the commentators go even much further. So if Mordechai took her as his wife, then how could she marry King Ahasuerus? How can a woman, of all things, have two husbands at the same time? And there's a fascinating explanation for this. This is what I love about our commentators. They come up with the most creative ways of getting out of complicated situations. What does it say? We know that Esther there was involved for a year in preparation of, of bathing and uh, being with, with perfume and all sorts of different spices, etc. So Esther had access to a mikvah. And after every time she had some kind of uh, 
consensual relations with either husband, she would go to the mikvah and then she could go to the other husband and be with him. So she went back and forth between Mordechai and Achashverosh. This is one commentary I came across, um, but she did it in a way that's respectful. The fact that a woman could have two husbands, where did that idea come from? Of course, back then, men had many wives. The edict forbidding multiple wives is only something that came about in the Middle Ages. Uh, so the fact that men could have more than one wife was completely acceptable. But perhaps if a woman observed the proper elements and ritual of purity, she could have two husbands as well. In any case, I just kind of bring that for a little bit of uh, entertainment value, although it is a genuine commentary. The fact that we don't know exactly what the relationship between Mordechai and Esther was, but it's quite clear that it was a somewhat oppressive one, somewhat that wasn't perhaps... Uh, as considerate as we'd like to see. Mordechai does what he thinks is right. He doesn't really have any regard for Esther, at least, you know, in the eyes of Rucham of Ice. And often when we think of Mordechai, and I think back of my childhood, you think of this uh, old guy with a beard sitting on the ground, um, trying to humbly not bow down to Haman. Uh, we don't, th I never thought of it as, as this very uh, presumptuous standing up to Haman in the middle of a public square, but just so, doing something that was enough to get Haman's goat. Uh, but you didn't think of this, this arrogant character at all. Uh, and perhaps we have to reevaluate how we see Mordechai as well. It's one thing to look at Vashti and Esther, but perhaps Mordechai is also a character that we need to uh, reconsider. We talk about Mordechai as perhaps the essence of maintaining Jewish identity uh, and Jewish independence and Jewish survival because of his forcing Esther to go to the king and plead for the, on behalf of the Jews after this complicated system of, of feasts. But what does it say at the end of the Megillah? What, what are the last words at the end of the Megillah? Anybody know how the Megillah ends? Is it say in great praise, what a brave woman that Esther was. She took things into her hands uh, she did what needed to be done, and it's because of her that the Jews are still survive. No, what does it say? It says, "Ki Mordechai Hayudi Mishne la Melech Hashvevosh vegadol la Yudim veratzui la Rovechav Doresh Tov la Amo vedover Shalom lechol Zaro." So I can read that in the English for you, uh, rather than simply translate it on my own. It says. You probably have it in front of you. For Mordechai the Jew ranked next to King Achashverosh and was highly regarded by the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brethren. He sought the good of his people and interceded for the welfare of all his kindred. What happened to Esther? Where did she go? She's the one who put her life at risk. It's because of Mordechai that she was in that position in the first place. Great, he said, you got to save the Jews. If you don't do it, Revach Vatsala Yamod La Yudimi Makom Acher. Maybe uh, salvation for the Jews will come from some other place, mimakom, and that's the, the one hint, perhaps, at the fact that God is actually present to some extent in the, this, because we use the term hamakom to describe God. Mordechai, what did he know? Somebody else is going to come and save the Jews? No, nah. he put Esther in, an, uh, in a terrible position, an, an, an enviable one, where she had no choice but to do what he suggested. Uh, and therefore, he's the one who is seen at the end here, as the savior of the Jewish people in, in uh, Persia. It says nothing about Esther. It only talks about it before. And Esther has become, what does she do? She goes to the king earlier on. Uh, you know, we, we see this transition in Esther. What does she demand? She demands that the Jews be given the opportunity to pay back those who wanted to annihilate them. And this is also one of the more troubling elements of the Megillat Esther, because if anything, and we've talked about this a few weeks ago as well, looking at uh, the exodus from Egypt, as victims of oppression, the last thing we should be doing is once we have been freed from that, is to take advantage of new power and oppress or annihilate others. You can say all you want that all the Persians at the instigation of Haman wanted to kill the Jews, but let's be realistic. Uh, we, we've said that about Germans as well. All the Germans were anti-Semites. They all, they, but that's not true. They may have been swayed by somebody, but to take revenge on an entire nation, 
uh, because we were about to be oppressed or we were oppressed, that's not, that shouldn't necessarily be the lesson of, of, of our oppression and our experience. And so this is one of the more troubling elements. And who instigates that? It's no longer Mordechai, it's Esther. Esther has become, in a sense, this kind of bloodthirsty woman out for vengeance against those who sought to destroy her people. Uh, it doesn't say that Mordechai suggested that. She's the one who suggests to the king. And not only that, but give, me, give us another day. We haven't been able to slaughter enough people. I'm, I'm paraphrasing slightly. But we haven't been able to do everything we need to do. Give us another day to keep attacking our enemies. So... I've thrown a lot of things at you. This, you know, this this, this Megillah is a phenomenally fascinating uh, story. It's a great one for kids. There's a beautiful woman who is taken in, becomes the savior of the Jewish people, uh, and that's the way we learn it as children. We we don't have an opportunity really to delve into some of the more complex elements of this Megillah. And, you know, what I've suggested to you today is not necessarily mine. Originally, the, the, these are commentaries from different uh, people from different walks of life within the Jewish people, from different points on the spectrum of religious or not religious, if that's uh, the way we can describe that spectrum. Let's say traditional or perhaps less traditional. And it's interesting, when Rucham Abayis comes to the... Uh, the end of her article dealing with Esther and the fact that it's, it's just another Cinderella. The question she asked at the beginning, and this is the title is in Hebrew, be beautiful and submit. Why I would not take Megillat Esther to an island if I were to take any book with me. And then she finishes off saying, this is in line with some of the things you said, if I were to go to an island and I had to choose a book, the book I would take is Megillah to Ruth, the book of Ruth, not of Esther. So that's enough for, that's, if anyone has any comments or suggestions or, or questions, uh, let's take a couple minutes and entertain that. I, I think that when I was growing up, it was like, uh, we looked at it, I think, as a fairy tale, as you suggested, mm. and that the uh, Esther was the fairy princess and even as much as, uh, as, you know, getting a scepter like a queen and the crown and everything else, I don't know whether we thought beyond that. We just thought of her as a fairy princess. And uh, most of the girls wanted to be a fairy princess and go to the ball like Cinderella would have gone. And that was, I think, as far as children would think at that time. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with you. I, I think that's the way I thought of it to a certain age as well. I don't know, and maybe I won't admit until what age, but the, there, there are ways of, of presenting this, I think, other than a fairy tale, to our children as well. I don't think we should be afraid to try to show them, in an appropriate way, of course, uh, the complexity of these kinds of stories, especially because our kids are so exposed to what's going on in the world. It's not like they're unaware. They can turn off, but they can't completely ignore what's going on in the world today in terms of relationships between men and women, uh, between uh, different races and different religious groups. They know what's going on. They have a better understanding than we ever had as children because they're exposed to it all the time and they can't avoid having some kind of discussion because it floods social media, it floods the news and no matter what, teachers need, and, and parents as well, of course, uh, need to try to deal with those, those issues. And I think we should try to refrain from looking at the story of Esther as something that's, as you suggest, Marion, simply a, a, a nice fairy tale with some perhaps challenging elements. It's a very troubling story. The fact that God is not in the story, except uh, as we may have hinted at Hamakom, or as I mentioned this morning at the Minyan, uh, where does the name Esther come from? There's a, a passage in Deuteronomy that says, Haster astir panai, from the word lehastir, to hide. I will hide my face from the people, this is in the book of Deuteronomy, because at some point they're going to leave me, God, and they're going to worship idols. They're going to be influenced by other cultures. They're going to assimilate. And at that point, I'm going to stop uh, being there for them. I'm going to hide my face from them. And perhaps the fact that Esther's name is very similar to that verb to hide, maybe that's why God's name is hidden here, because the values and the culture we see in this Megillah 
However, it managed to be included in the Tanakh, in the, and I'm glad it was, uh, they reflect perhaps not the values that are the most basic ones uh, to the Jewish people. Revenge, slaughter, submission. I don't know. There's some very troubling elements of this story, and perhaps that's why God is not... Uh, clearly present in the Megillah. There are some troubling aspects of the story, and, and uh, maybe that's a good reason for God not to be there. Uh, there's another commentary that says God is not there because it demonstrates that the Jewish people uh, can act on their own initiative without God's involvement. They can take things into their own hands and act in a way based on the values that they've learned from the Torah, but God doesn't have to be uh, nominally present in that story in order for that to happen. So there are very different ways of taking, uh, and and that's that's the beauty of Megillat Esther and I think our our entire scriptures. You can interpret it in many different ways, and we need to be open to looking at in in more creative and inclusive manner than we have in the past, not just as children but as adults as well. Anyone have any other comments or? It would it would appear to me that Haman could not have done this on his own. Um, that if you're having such a decree, you have to set up an infrastructure to be able to uh, carry out that kind of command. And so throughout the land, he had to have a, a you know a huge uh, army of of uh, people who were willing and ready to do that horrific act, uh, which helps, I think, understand perhaps the end of the, uh, the Megillah, as you put it. Uh, it's not the nicest ending. Um, but yet, um, is it just the leader that you have to get rid of or you have to punish? Or, or is it uh, everyone else who's complicit? Excellent question. It, it, you're, I, I would agree with you. It couldn't possibly just have been Haman. Um, just as it couldn't possibly have only been uh, Goebbels or Hitler or, or anyone else that who, who's taken uh, such uh, brutal approach to dealing with the Jewish people. You had to be able to find those with whom you have something in common in terms of the fear and hatred of outsiders and certainly the ability to educate them according to your will, uh, which we've seen in different instances in, in different places, not just in Germany. In Nazi Germany. So, uh, David, your point is well taken. Yeah. I just want to add one last little entertaining element because I, I love the use of words and how they cause us to try to think of where have I heard that word before and why is that word being chosen. So, I mentioned the word vatilakach, Esther was taken, just as women were taken in different contexts, particularly for as wives in different biblical stories. There's one word what it says with Vashti. It says Vatema'en Lavo. When the king bid her come and attend the feast and show her beauty to his guests, it says Vatema'en. She refused to come. So that word Vatema'en, every time I read it, I, I recall a few instances. And perhaps the most famous one is when the wife of Potiphar, Mrs. Potiphar, Zuleika, as she's often referred to in Midrash, approaches Joseph in a seductive manner. What does it say about Joseph? Vatima'en. He refused. He refused her approaches. He acted in a modest way, in this idea of, of treating some, you know, of acting modestly. Uh, he refused. Vatima'en. And there's another very powerful Vatima'en as well. When Jacob finds out, when he's brought the um pasim of joseph covered in the blood after his brothers return following joseph's uh, being taken down as a slave to egypt he refuses to be comforted by his brothers he remains in grief and grieving as a matter of fact for the rest of his life until he meets joseph again so that refusal is maybe not just a momentary thing uh, but it can also be uh, characteristic of one's personality, which is consistent with one's behavior. Jacob demonstrated that refusal to be comforted. Joseph, once he perhaps 
realizes maybe a little more about his role in life. He refuses to, to uh, be tempted by Mrs. Potiphar and then begins a process of refusing to behave in the way he behaved before with the type of arrogance that brought about his being taken down to Egypt in the first place. And similar Vashti, Vatima'ain, this idea of refusing. And again, the instances may not be necessarily comparable, but the fact that why do people refuse to do something, uh, and that's why it's wonderful to be familiar with the text in the, in the Tanakh and the Bible, because whoever wrote and edited this uses words very purposefully. They're not by chance, they just happen to use this word again. They want us to think of these other instances where Vitamayin is used, and we're able to because it's used so rarely. It's not those words that we read uh, hundreds of times in the Tanakh, but it's the words in a context or in its infrequency that allows us to associate with uh, other instances where that word has been used. Uh, so that's just another example. And the whole idea of comparing the Joseph story with Esther is something that Rucham Weiss does as well. She talks about the fact that Joseph, uh, similar to Esther's background, being in a sense orphaned, taken away to another place, being an outsider, rising to power, but unlike Esther, who needs Achashverosh, who needs Mordechai, Joseph, based on his own skill and abilities at interpreting dreams, He's the one who's able to bring himself out of the pit, so to speak. Esther, a woman, needs help from someone else. Anyway, hopefully that's given you a little bit to think about as you listen to the Megillah, uh, both this evening and tomorrow. And I'll just remind you that the, the services this evening are at 6 on the regular Zoom link, but the Megillah reading at 6.30 is on a separate Megillah link. It's in the email that you were sent. If you don't have it, make sure you contact the office so you can access that Megillah reading. Usually it takes about an hour. This evening, because it's a slightly different format, we don't unfortunately have the uh, 90 plus readers. So it'll be less than a half an hour this evening and about the same tomorrow morning, just so you know. So it's certainly a manageable amount of time. Look forward to seeing you all. Chag Purim Sameach. Chag Sameach. Chag Purim Sameach. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. Michael, can I ask you a question before you go? Always. Uh, the talk about uh, words, uh, but names as well. What is the reference to Hadassah? That the father of Hadassah, that is Esther. Right, right. So do you know any, like, is, is her name Hadassah and changed to Esther, or is Hadassah someone else? I'm, I'm not understanding that little phrase. And Hadassah, I mean, is an important name. 